It's really lovely to be here today. Um, I did say to Gráinne when she asked me to speak, well, surely not only am I bored with my story, but a lot of people may already have heard my story before. So I'm sorry if I'm boring you. I'll try to concentrate on maybe some new aspects of it, you know. But what I'm really going to talk to you about is really the impact that the rheumatoid arthritis has had on me and how, how the change in the last uh, 21 years of those was largely due to the self-management programme. The first 10 years of my disease with RA were really what I could only describe as horrific. So I suppose for a starting point, it's better if I kind of let you know the type of person I was before I developed arthritis because really, you know, I am a different person. You know, I am a person who lives with arthritis, is really a part of me. And I've actually become uh, very uh, closely acquainted with it and I'm quite comfortable with it, you know. But before I developed rheumatoid arthritis, I had lots of hobbies which were very much uh, domesticated. I trained as a home economics teacher and I'd really decided I wanted to do that at about 14 years of age when I was locked away in boarding school and I particularly liked the subject and any subject that was related to it. So I was constantly making things from the time I was really small, you know, BBC's programmes on, on creating things. I absolutely loved cooking and everything like that. So really I decided when I was 14 that I wanted to become a home economics teacher and I would have travelled to England or wherever to actually do that. Um, I trained in Sign Hill, but I used to cycle. This is me on the bicycle, but I couldn't get the right image because it was my brother's bicycle. So if you can imagine me sitting on my brother's racing bicycle, uh, cycling in from Black Rock into Trinity to my education lectures, that's really what I was like. And what I'm trying to tell you is I was actually very fit and well. I wasn't a team sports person, but thankfully I was born sort of quite flexible and everything else. And I'm a bit of a tomboy. I'm from the country, River Boyne running through our fields at home and I used to fish. I fished on freshwater lakes as well as sometimes the rivers, you know. I loved my high heels and I really was happy with the teenagers in the secondary school that I worked in. I was less than two years married and being the idealistic person that I am, I thought it would be really nice to have your children when you're young uh, so that you could sort of, you know, have more fun with them in your 50s, etc. Okay, and so... Um, Really, I was less than two years married and I had a four-week-old baby when the first signs of this serious and shockingly devastating disease came along. So that's, you get the picture. I was on maternity leave, but I was, uh, it was a lovely, beautiful hot summer in uh, the July of, uh, well, it was practically August, I suppose, really, when I saw the first symptoms. But when I realised that something funny was happening, my finger started to stiffen. My son was being breastfed and he was only four weeks old. And uh, the first sign was stiffening. And when we asked my GP, you know, what could this be? He said, is there any history of rheumatoid in the family? And I said, no, I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with the word rheumatoid. But in actual fact, my aunt and uncle did have rheumatoid arthritis. So following the stiffening of my fingers, along came what we call fleeting joint pains. And so having been well able to sort of, you know, lift my baby at night and, and feed a hungry baby, you know, several times in the day and do all the things that you had to do in relation to that, nappy changing and everything else, I found that I started with fleeting joint pains that were extremely uh, crippling. Uh, I'd only ever been in hospital once before, and that was with a broken leg at about the same time that I decided to be a home economics teacher. So I know the pain of breaks and sprains and things like that. And that's really what the pain of rheumatoid arthritis was like. You know, it was really like a serious sort of sprain, strain and, and uh, you know, broken bones and whatever. OK, so I uh, found it really difficult as the days went on with the symptoms to actually lift uh, my son out of the cot to take him into the bed to feed him and so on. And at this stage, we had already been to the GP and the GP thought, yes, it possibly is rheumatoid arthritis. He actually used the word straight away. And so for another two weeks, I continued to breastfeed him. But um, every time I came back into him, I looked more like a wooden doll. He used to tell me I, I looked like a wooden doll because I could barely move my shoulders from the side of my body. And it was becoming more in, uh, difficult to actually uh, lift my son. So I had private insurance and I was fortunately seen within uh, six weeks by a rheumatologist and I was in hospital by the time my son was just 10 weeks old. 
And when I was brought into hospital and when I was told that this was most definitely my diagnosis because it was of both sides of the body, I had these fleeting joint pains and one minute, you know, that my knee would be swollen and so sore that you couldn't even bend it in the bed at night. And if you did try and bend it, then you wouldn't be able to straighten it again so easily because the pain was just so acute. And, you know, where I used to love running up the stairs while I was in college, I used to even take two steps at a time. So happy was I to be there and possibly be to, go, to be going gallivanting on my bike or whatever. Um, you know, I had actually reached a stage where even sometimes getting off the side of a curb was actually, you know, very difficult or even walking into the hospital to stay and, and get my diagnosis. So really, uh, for the first um, uh, you know, few weeks, that was really quite distressing. But still, being the incurably optimistic person that I had, and I, I could actually see the funny side of it. What was funny about it, I don't know, but I sort of, I was kind of thinking, imagine, here I thought I was going to be doing X, Y, and Z when I was 24, and look at me, I'm absolutely, I feel like I've been in a washing machine, I feel battered. And there was a little old lady in the same room as me, and guess what her diagnosis was? Severe advanced rheumatoid arthritis. She had lost all her hair. Her um, bed covering was a lamb uh, sheepskin covering on, on the bed. She had to use a walking frame to get out to the bathroom, but she was doing her embroidery. And what I decided to do was I plucked up the courage to ask her, even though she had rheumatoid arthritis and that was my diagnosis, to give me some tips. And she said, don't stop doing anything. And that's what I like to think I tried to do. But for the first 10 years, what was really difficult was, you know, to do sufficient, you know, to, to keep myself comfortable. I had a tendency to overdo things. But it was really useful to have that. So off I went with the medication that I was given straight away. And this really did help a little bit. But obviously, with most rheumatoid arthritis drugs, you have to wait for several weeks and possibly even months until you see really improvement, you know. So... Um, uh, when I went back home then there were times when my son might have had maybe a slight fever or something like that and you'd find yourself alone in the house unable to open a Calpol bottle. I remember one night I felt like actually smashing it along the wall because I couldn't open that. So changing a uh, nappy uh, was a bit of a nightmare and there remember I was an idealistic I was even using toweling nappies and safety pins okay so this is you know completely alien to a lot of people who are so well used to the um, all the modern conveniences that we have okay um, at the time when I left hospital I sort of decided yes I know it's a serious condition but I'm going to work seriously hard at this I'm going to work really hard to try and be as well as I can be for this kind of severe disease and they were telling me yes it was was very severe onset and so it was likely maybe to continue like that but I decided you know to go along and make a bash at it anyway so I remained the smiling kind of person and um, you know secretly inside I suppose there was a fear about the future but I thought that if I had to give up my job that I might do something for the patient organization little did I know the patient organization was just after being born arthritis foundation of Ireland was founded I think in 1981 so it was literally just getting up off the ground so for the first 10 years you know this is what I would describe it like it was just like you know this interfering front seat passenger in my car you know when you're learning to drive or when you have somebody who keeps commenting on your driving that you're driving too fast or too slow or something like that you know and they really do interfere fear with you being able to concentrate on your road or whatever so this is what this horrible disease was like for me it was like it sat into my lovely car the destination that I thought I was going to go on the clouds gathered overhead and here it was just grabbing hold of the steering wheel on me you know telling me I was you know zapping my confidence and everything else that's what it felt like and it began to erode that confidence even more as time went on so it really I would describe this this disease like a, an interfering front seat passenger nobody wants one okay and so for the first uh, 10 years then what would have happened is that really I got all sorts of advice from people everybody from the casual person you met on the doorstep with uh, some delivery to the person in the shop to you know well uh, meaning um, acquaintances and friends and relatives suggesting that I try this diet and that diet and this therapy and that therapy and the other therapy and for me it was really confusing and that little pile of books is actually just representative of all the misinformation and all the misleading sort of stuff that I had to lead to uh, I had to uh, you know avenues I felt I nearly had to 
go down because people were saying, oh yes, but such and such down the road, she did this and then now she can jump ditches. You know, I really felt I had to, then that, that became costly. So this was misleading and it was costly for me. But um, it was also kind of confusing trying to know with health services and health structures generally, where do I get physiotherapy? I knew my body told me I needed a physiotherapist. I kept asking my consultant. He thought I didn't need it because he felt I was doing enough. But then I kept persecuting my GP and he said, oh, actually, a new girl just started here recently. And luckily for me, she had actually worked in rheumatology and this was wonderful. But really, I wanted more than that. I knew that a serious disease like this needed more health professionals. I really needed my rheumatologist and my GP and everybody else, but there were so many more people that I needed. So by the time that um, the arthritis um, self-management program first started as a pilot program in the early 90s, uh, for me, I was lucky that I was a member of the arthritis patient organisation. I saw an ad which said that they were starting a pilot program and that they wanted individuals to do this who would actually really, um, you know, maybe deliver the program as time went on. And so I jumped at the chance. And this reference book for me was really most important. That was a fantastic part of the course okay um, but what I learned when I did that course was that there was you know a secret that had nobody had told me before this was that you know the arthritis pain and the disease can create a whole lot of other symptoms that I've medication problems that you can be sad that you can have all these sort of difficult emotions and Grania talked about emotional pain I would actually say for me even though the physical pain was really bad the emotional pain was far far worse and the stress of it all and you know maybe you know fatigue interfering and everything else this was really awful. So for me, what I learned to do was to kind of befriend that pain and fatigue and to use it to help me to monitor my disease activity. So that helped me to report then to my healthcare team and it helped to show me how I could actually get help from all these different um, health professionals, you know, to help me break that and, and break that cycle of pain because that was one of the important elements of information in the course about this cycle of pain and that, you know, you could be, you were the most important person in really this healthcare team who could actually make things happen. And so there were a whole lot of people who've really helped me. Family and friends are a great help too, but what I loved as well when you did the self-management program, you were sitting in with a group of people who also had similar conditions. And what I learned was, yes, their feelings were the exact same as mine, you know. Uh, we all experienced the fear of the future and everything else. And so there was a real sense of kind of belonging. And the most difficult emotion for me, I think, was because I was still very young, um, was I actually felt guilty for having this, what we would call maybe an older person's disease, you know. It, I thought the course was going to be more scientific in nature, but really I found that there were lots of lovely simple messages, okay. Um, I was uh, doing this course too at a very important time. For the first time I was told, and it was just 10 years since I'd been diagnosed, that I needed my elbow replaced and that I needed a lot of hand surgery. And so this for me was a real shock. I kind of, for the first time in 10 years, I got really afraid. So it didn't matter, even though I was the optimistic person that I was, and even though I was trying to work hard at, at being well, you know, it wasn't enough really. And so the course came along for me at a really wonderful time. And these are the simple things that I learned and this helped me to survive this far. So it was really as if I pulled this car into the lay-by and I sort of said, listen, that's enough of this. You are not going to control my life anymore. It was like I stood and grabbed hold of this interfering front seat passenger and said, you're going into the back of this car. I won't be able to forget that you're here. I need to use my rear view mirror. I need to always remember that I've got a serious and chronic condition. And this I find really difficult to do. And particularly those of us who've done our course and realize we're actually doing way too much. Because I felt guilty, I was really trying to overwork. And so for me, that's what really, you know, the, the, the clouds lifted. It was fantastic to be able to learn, you know, some simple things. So I learned that really the positive thinking was important in the attitude. So I was kind of half right. So, you know, my confidence was boosted a little bit. But sometimes you have to practice that really hard on the really dark days. Um, I learned how to set goals and action plans, you know, towards achieving those goals. That I could do them, you know, over a space of time. I learned how to plan and 
learned, uh, you know, the, how to problem solve in relation to all of the things that I would um, encounter. And I learned that the communication skills were really important, whether it be with the casual person I met in the shop or the health professional. So there's a lot more besides that I would have learned, but we don't have time to go into that today. But those four simple skills are the ones that I really remember from the course. So self-management in action, what it did for me then, it actually gave me the courage. I had already joined a leisure centre, but it gave me the courage to experiment a bit more with the type of exercises and everything else that I would do. And so in the community, in the local branch of Arthritis Ireland, I got involved in all sorts of activities, you know, whether it be the Nordic walking programme on the Curra, I myself joined an aquarobics class and things like that, and, you know, learned how to include all of these things in my everyday life. And as time goes on, my intention is to keep on experimenting with other fun exercise activities to help keep um, my bones strong and keep as well as I can. Um, of course, the picture is uh, very important here of my role then with uh, um, Grania as a master trainer. Um, I cheat by doing the course over and over again. As a leader, you get to do the course over and over again. So you also get to set your action plans and achieve goals. So that's really, really wonderful. So uh, thank you for listening to me and um, I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your your evening. Um, I'd like to say then as well, as well as the, um, with the new medications and everything else, it's actually possible to put that interfering front seat passenger into the boot of the car. And so, uh, locked in. Now and again, it does kind of uh, grumble and everything else, and you've got to unlock it and, and do some other things, try another strategy. Thank you. Thank you.